Ooh, the overall goal and benefits of stripping is all the money you can make riding that Hi, I'm Jonathan David, and welcome to another episode of Sheer Talk. Hand stripping is a specialized skill, so anytime you can take your career further and learn a specialized skill, and you can kind of like be in a niche market, it's a benefit for any groomer because a lot of people don't know how to hand strip. And while it's not the most common request that you're going to get, when you do know how to do it and you do get those clients that are in your area who are looking for it, they're willing to pay a premium because they know that nobody else in the area is able to do it. So I know that in my area of South Florida, there's only like two other people that I know of who really know how to do proper hand stripping. So I used to get a lot of hand strip clients when I had my salon and you know, you can charge a premium for it because it is a specialized skill and you do get to show how you've gone for further education and you've really become a better groomer. And it's just, you know, every extra skill that you can have, I think is a benefit in, in the long run for any groomer. Absolutely. Hand stripping is a niche kind of technique. It's not something you can just do nilly willy because if you just watch a video or read some books and you start doing hand stripping, you can overstrip a coat, you can damage the coat, you can uh, irritate the skin. When I wanted to learn a little bit more about hand stripping, I actually reached out to some breeders in my area and I asked them if I could come and you know, learn from them directly because it was something that I was not so familiar with and I had learned a little bit in the salon that I worked in at the time, but I really wanted to perfect it because I wanted to do some um, competing. Sometimes just reaching out to somebody, going to dog shows, whatever it is, but I think hands-on learning for hand stripping is definitely the way you have to start doing it. And then once you've got a feel for it and you understand how to do it, you can watch the videos and you can read the books. There's a webinar that Grace did called I'd Rather Be Stripping. That's kind of like the next best thing in this time that we have right now to hands-on training is actually watching somebody do it live where they can kind of explain what they're doing um, side by side with um, maybe you having a dog. But it's something that I think you need to start out a little bit more hands-on and then really get into the further education. That's a really hard question because there's so many different companies that make such a variety of stripping tools. So there's, you know, carding knives, there's stripping knives, there's coarse, fine, medium, and they all have a different reason why they're made that way. There's smaller ones, larger ones. There are some that are made for the face area, for the, the tight areas of the cheeks and the throat, others that are made for bulk pulling along the back. So as far as brand goes, I think it's really a matter of what you like and what you're comfortable with. For me personally, I like wooden handles. So some have a metal handle, some have a rubber handle, and some have a wooden handle. Just like scissors are really kind of personalized into you know what you want to do for your particular hand and which scissor fits you best, there are stripping knives the same way that kind of fit you better. The ones that are made of metal handles with a metal blade are going to be heavier in your hand. So some people you know, might get more fatigue from that. Um, and when I use metal ones, it rubs my skin and I tend to get a little bit of a blister. So that's why I like the wooden ones because they're more gentle. But other people find that the rubber handled ones are even more gentle on their hands. So just like scissors, there's like all different ones that fit different hands. So you kind of have to just try them out and see which one you really like the best. Carding is what they do at the door to see if you're old enough to go inside and see the stripping. I always love talking about stripping. Carding and stripping are two different techniques. Carding is using a flat stripping tool to with kind of finer teeth and the teeth are shaped a little bit differently. And that is to hold flush with the coat and pull towards you to rake out the undercoat. So with carding, you're pulling out the soft, fuzzy undercoat. Whereas with stripping, that's the technique of actually plucking and that's for the outer coat, the rough coat. So when you're talking about carding, that's typically used for spaniels, 
uh, cockers, springers, setters, breeds like that. Or when you have a terrier coat that has a lot of undercoat, like a lot of Westies grow that really downy undercoat. Cairn terriers tend to get that thick downy undercoat. So you use the carding tool to rake through and then it leaves the harsh coat in place and it just removes the soft, fuzzy, dull undercoat that is really thick and bulky and it gives it that dull appearance and it leaves that nice uh, shiny harsh coat. And the stripping knives are for actually gripping and plucking. So you use your thumb and your finger and you pluck rather than rake. Um, and that technique helps to pull the coat out so it can regenerate and grow. Rolling the coat. Whenever I hear this, I think of Adele. Rolling in the deep. All right, I'm not a singer. Um, so rolling the coat. Rolling the coat is a technique where you strip the outer layer of the coat and you expose the under layer. Not the undercoat, but a layer that had been stripped before. So you've got multiple layers of coat. So when you pull the outer layer, you expose the shorter, tighter coat. And then as that grows, what you had plucked previously is growing in underneath. So you get a layer on top, you have this layer that's growing underneath, and then you pluck this out and this grows longer and the new coat grows underneath. So you keep having these sort of rolling layers. So that's what rolling the coat is. It's when you have multiple layers of coat growing at different intervals so that you can strip certain areas to expose the muscles on the shoulder, like on the throat, because when you do hand stripping, depending on the breed, the throat coat and the shoulder coat might be tighter than along the back or the jacket. Maybe where the neck and the, the top line meet, you have a little break there, so you might leave it longer in there so you have a nice smoother, rounder transition rather than having a right angle. So that's gonna be left longer. So you wouldn't pluck this area all the time, but you would pluck the shoulders tighter to expose those muscles or the hips. So when you have a rolling coat, you have different layers of the coat at different lengths growing at different intervals and you pluck it at different times so that you're rolling the coat. Yes, okay, so if you have a terrier that the hair has gone soft and the customer wants to try to bring them back to hand stripping, it can be done, okay? What you have to do though is you have to bald the dog. So you have to pull all the hair out and then you have to let it regenerate and the new growth will be a little bit more harsh. And then you're gonna have to do that again. You might have to do it a couple of times. So for example, I did this with a Cocker Spaniel. I had a client dog who had um, a Cocker Spaniel who had been clipped um, for four years. The body had been clipped, the legs were scissored, it was a suburban trim. And the owner surrendered the dog and one of my stylists wanted to take the dog and start using him for competition. So we spoke to a bunch of breeders and they said, yes, you can bring the coat back. So we did, we carded out all of his undercoat every other week, just carded, carded, pulled his back coat down, kept doing this over and over. It took about a year, but his entire flat coat came back beautifully. But the process was harsh on the dog, I will tell you. It did cause sores on the body. Um, it was probably very uncomfortable the first couple of times we had to do it. Would I ever do it again? I probably would opt not to if the dog was totally soft and had been clippered for a long time. I probably would opt not to do that because it's painful to bring it back. You know, you do have to sort of, the, the hair when you strip it is not rooted into the coat the same way. But once it grows out and it becomes soft, it has deep anchored roots. And so when you pull it, it, it's like pulling out your own hair. So it does hurt the first couple times, but it's kind of like, you know, I don't know how many of, of you ladies that are watching have ever used like the epilady, you know, but like, you know, the epilady was like a hair removal for your legs and it was basically these two rotating springs that ripped out your hair. And you know, you see on the commercials, the lady's like, oh, this is wonderful. But my sisters did it and I can tell you, they were not like, oh, this is great. They were like, ah, oh, Jesus Christ, this hurts. You know, I mean, it was painful, so, but they got used to it, right? Because the hair doesn't get anchored into the skin quite the same way after it's been plucked a bunch of times. If you pluck your eyebrows, it's easier to pluck them after a while than if you first do it. So it's the same concept. So you can bring the coat back by really kind of balding the dog and regenerating the growth over and over and over. It'll never probably come back quite the same way, but it'll come back harsh and it'll come back correct.
As a bald man, I am offended by this question and I don't think balding is ever necessary. There are cases where that can happen and let me explain. So stripping dirty hair is easier than stripping clean hair. Once there's a lot of oils built up on the coat and a little bit of dirt, the hair pulls out a lot more easily. And generally when you have a coat that is ready for stripping, it's not anchored very uh, well into the skin. So that coat is ready to shed. And that's the whole point of stripping is you're pulling the coat out, you're not hurting the dog. It's a natural shed cycle of the coat, you're just helping it along. So when you pluck the hair, um, you're pulling out the hair that's ready to fall out and you're just aiding in the shedding process. So if you have a coat that's regularly maintained and it's, and it's you know um, stripped on a regular basis and you do some stripping before the bath, that isn't going to irritate the skin because it's been well maintained and the skin is accustomed to being stripped and the coat is rolled. So if you strip them and then bathe them, it's not going to irritate the skin, but then you're going to lose some of the oils. So if you're trying to show the dog or you're trying to compete with the dog, a lot of competitors and show people, they'll only bathe the furnishings of the dog and not necessarily the harsh coat on the jacket because they wanted to retain that harsh texture and those essential oils that are in the skin. Now, if you have a pet dog that gets hand stripped and it hasn't been in for a while and you have to do a lot of stripping and you either have a lot of soft coat in there, which does tend to pull on the skin more. So if you have a lot of soft coat that you're pulling out and you're doing excessive stripping, then when you pull that out, there is a possibility that you will get um, hair follicles that are blown open and um, a little bit irritated. And then if you shampoo and wash the dog, you kind of open the door to the opportunity for bacteria to get into those open hair follicles. Now, if you're using clean water and clean shampoos that are not diluted for long periods of time and you're using clean tools, then the chances of getting a skin infection after stripping are low. But can it happen? Yes, it absolutely can happen. If I have a dog in my salon who has not been stripped for a while, I will usually card through the coat a little bit to get some of the undercoat out, then I'll wash and dry them, and then I'll do some of the stripping, and I might break it into a couple of sessions so that the dog can get back into condition. But if it's a dog that's regularly maintained, then and it's a pet dog, then I will wash it and finish off with a little bit of stripping after because uh, they're not going into a show, they're not going into a competition, they just want a clean, well-maintained dog. So you kind of have to weigh the variables Yes, sometimes it can happen and in that instance you may want to do a stripping session without a bath and then have them come back a week or two later when the skin has had a chance to um, heal and cool down and then maybe do the bath and the blow dry then and then finish off with the stripping after that. Okay, if you wanna get into stripping, take classes. Do hands-on classes, okay? That is the best advice I can give you. Go to somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, when I wanted to learn how to do you know, hand stripping on spaniels, I called up a Springer breeder in my area and I introduced myself and I said, hi, my name is Jonathan, I am a competitive groomer and I really would like to learn your breed. Um, I'm not very well versed in how to do a Springer, so, um, I would be willing to come and bathe a bunch of your dogs and help you out if you would be willing to give me some lessons. And the woman was incredibly nice. She was a judge and a, and a breeder and a handler. And she said, absolutely, I would love to. And she invited me down for the day. And she actually didn't even have me like work for her in exchange for it. She just had a bunch of dogs ready. We spent the whole day grooming a bunch of Springer Spaniels. We had a blast doing it. She taught me all the finer points. And by the end of the day, we had hit it off so well that she said, you know, pick anyone that you want to use whenever you compete. And that's how I ended up having my competition dog. So, um, you know, go to dog shows, talk to some handlers, talk to some breeders, see if you can make connections that way. Go to some of your other groomers that are, you know, terrier or spaniel groomers in the competition world and ask them if you can take a lesson with them or if you can tag along with them. A lot of times they need assistance at the shows to help them when they're doing like, when they're doing poodle, terrier, sporting, mixed breed, you know, all other purebred. When they're doing all the classes, they don't have time to bathe their own dogs. 
So they would love to have an assistant and in exchange they'll teach you their techniques. So make those connections, reach out to the people, ask if you can take a private lesson, watch the webinars, watch the seminars, you know, continuing education. That's how you hone your skills. And there's always somebody who does something a little bit different or they have a technique that, you know, somebody else doesn't have and it just clicks with you a little bit more. So you have to just jump in, get out there, be proactive. You're not just going to be able to open a book and learn how to do this technique. It's something you have to really put the work into and learn how to do it and hone your skill. But if you do in the long run, you'll have an amazing skill that you can use whether you want to compete or not. If it's just something you want to offer to your clients, if you're the best in the area, you're going to gain all the clients and shut everybody else down.